Namaskar. Hello and welcome to Free Guru's channel. I'm your host, Sri Ayer. Joining me is Sridhar Chityalaji. And this is episode 444 of Daily Global Insights. Of course, we are not doing it daily now. We are doing it twice a week. But there's a lot to cover. So let's welcome Sridhar Chityalaji. Sridhar Ji, Namaskar. How are you, sir? Namaskar. Good morning and good evening to everybody. Doing very good, sir. And good to, good to see you. Thank you, sir. And uh, before we kick off today's news digest or analysis, we are going to first give you a teaser on what's coming. Here we go. I beg four. your pardon. That was not the right one. Just give me one second, sir. Hold on a second. Still waking up, sir. I'm sorry. It's all right. Some of you have said that there is not enough time to read the teaser. It is just like, you know, giving you a taste of what is going to come. What each item is, we are going to be explaining it in a detailed manner. See that the 7% growth for India in 2024. A little bit more uh, details on that, sir. What exactly does it mean? Is it better than what we thought or is it as the same? Take it away, sir. Well, I think first and foremost, uh, it's a very credible report from the chief economic advisor, Anand. Nageshwaran, Nageshwaran. Uh, who has yeah. laid out, yeah, Anant Nageshwaran, who has laid out the case uh, as to what is driving uh, the economic growth, and uh, he's also laid out the case uh, as not just in FY24, even FY25, uh, they expect the growth to be greater than seven percent. In fact, you know, some economists predict that it could be sustained even for three to four years. This is rebutting several theories. Uh, including by the former RBI governor that uh, these pro PLI programs are not working, the economic growth is not robust, in, in India is going to take a hit. Contradicting all those numbers, if you recall, Sriji, last year we had said, though they've been predicting 6.8, 6.4, 6.2, 6.2, we had indicated even last year that FY24 will be 7% as opposed to 6.2 or 6.4%. So what is driving? This is the big story. It's a big story. India will be the largest kind of GDP growth economy and it will cross the 5 trillion. 5 trillion is a big number because India will then become a nominal GDP third largest economy. So what is the big story here? The big story is the consumer confidence and sentiments. The so-called middle class is working. This is the whole theory for the last 10 years. You know, India's middle class is big and they're spending. And so that is one thing which is uh, driving growth. Second, there's been credit expansion and containment of inflation uh, because there is both positive uh, investment flows and industries are beginning to invest and you're seeing the uptick in the manufacturing. So that is the second uh, kind of a big story behind what is driving growth. 
And third has been the exports. So the export market has been picking up. And I think India will cross on the export side, two trillion. And I think it will be, you know, somewhere between two and a half, uh, you know, 2.25 to 2.5 trillion dollars in terms of global trade, which is quite a significant number when you look at it. And the last, if I have to add, India is one of the biggest infrastructure spenders and the infrastructure continues to grow. Weak story. Uh, while everybody is focused around doom and gloom and fighting wars all around the world, India has really focused inward and in building a strong and resilient, sustained economy, Sriji. Thank you, sir. And uh, in Kabul, there was a conclave of 10 nations. We know that even Pakistan, I think, has not recognized the Taliban regime in Afghanistan. But yet, everything, for all practical purposes, this is in place and things are going on smoothly. Talk to us a little bit about this conclave, sir. Who else attended? It's very, very interesting. Uh, besides India, there was China, there was Russia, there was Iran, there was Pakistan. So it's when you look at this conclave, it looks like they are trying to create a kind of a new economic order around the Central Asia. The rest of the nations were the Central Asian republics. If I'm correct, even Saudi Arabia also attended, uh, either Saudi Arabia or UAE, one of the nations uh, attended uh, this event. But I was just focused on these five nations, which is China, Russia, Iran, India, and Pakistan. It's a kind of a real amalgam um, which connects uh, Afghanistan to Central Asia. What exactly is the discussion? There is the discussion that uh, you know, Taliban has to be brought into the mainstream and Taliban will provide secure gateway because it's a very important corridor into Central Asia and Europe. So there is a lot of things and nobody wanted to miss out of this party and understand uh, what exactly is the dynamics and how this is going to play out. Uh, you know, what is the contribution of China, Pakistan in terms of the economic outcomes, Sriji? Nothing. What is the contribution of Iran except for the border skirmishes? But it wants Iran to be, it wants Afghanistan to be an important corridor. So there is both security. There is also the concept of stabilization of Taliban in terms of a secure gateway, but also to provide much needed legitimacy. As you correctly pointed out, many countries have still not recognized legitimacy to a Taliban within Afghanistan. So that's the significance of this event, Sriji. Um, now let's take a quick look at global market. The tech layoffs have ballooned in January and most companies such as the Magnificent Seven, uh, Atmanam, these companies are now looking at uh, whether the some of the tasks can be artificial intelligence based, which essentially means a reduction in headcount. Is this a trend that's going to only go up, Sriji? No, the trend is not only going to go up. I think uh, the banks also fired their salvo, which is effectively said, you know, two major banks, I think Bank of America and JP Morgan, no, notably JP Morgan said, the introduction of AI will probably result in somewhere between 15 to 30 percent reduction in the workforce because much of the work can be implanted and done through uh, these AI, uh, generative AI engines. So therefore, there is already a talk about this within the industry, at least from in the United States. As far as the tech layoffs, one of the highest numbers just in January, you know, close to 24,000 people were laid off. And the major, as you kind of, uh, as you, uh, let me get this right. Are you saying Atmanam? So the Atmanam group or the Magnificent Seven, you know, some of them have indicated they had to reshift the jobs to the AI segment they also resulted in some of the jobs getting kind of not warranted or not required. Plus, there is also, which they are not saying, is that there is a reduction in the demand. Uh, they have to prune the cost, excess costs, uh, which they were able to incur under, you know, very accommodative interest rates in the 2019, 2020 and the 2021 time period, Sri G. So this is what you are saying. And you will see much more kind of uh, this type of... Uh, um, situation in the for the rest of the year. And crude prices, uh, we predicted that they will actually go down, I think, at the beginning of the year. I, I'm seeing a little bit of a, a tick up. 
is it because of the recent geopolitical events in in and around red sea and uh, hormuz strait sir yes the oil prices went up for uh, is basically because of um, the supply disruptions what has not what has helped uh, that this becoming an unmitigated disaster is the chinese economy which is you know they are one of the largest consumers of uh, uh, the oil um their demand their economy has contracted by you know somewhere between 12 to kind of uh, the demand in terms of this oil has contracted by 12 to 14% so this in turn has resulted in uh you know prices remaining where they are if chinese had sustained their demand levels the oil demand levels you would have seen the prices touching you know uh, $90 or even crossing $90 um a situation that's one reason this is my version of the story there's a lot of oil that is being stolen uh, not accounted for that is getting uh, you know pushed into countries like china what kind of delta impact they have i don't know nobody has quantified it as yet but there's a lot of stolen oil that is getting siphoned off in red sea and persian gulf and through suez etc shriji ghost armada is a name that has been given to this uh, several republican congressmen and senators have touched upon it so all these things right they get started but i don't see the logical end where there is an investigation that there is some sort of an action plan what is really going to happen with this ghost armada you think sir we are running i mean sorry my dear democrats and democratic friends uh, i'm sorry to say this but under the present regime there is nothing called as investigation documentation and enforcement nothing okay i'm not suggesting it has happened in uh, republican administrations it seldom happens doesn't matter which part of the world it is but what we are witnessing currently in terms of lawlessness and uh, you know this open sesame in terms of stealing looting and plundering that is going on not just the low end item but even on the high end items uh, is quite amazing uh, we will only know at the end of 2024 because there is an insurance cost in terms of uh, you know for each of the shipments there's an insurance cost so what is going to be the uh, the blowout as a result of this we will know but nobody has quantified the kind of the losses and how that this is getting uh, is going to be addressed or this is just going to be absorbed as part of doing business region if i have to use the corporate word before we go on sir i have one question we talked about india paying for its crude from russia in rupees now if you try to look at the trade between russia and india india is paying close to 40 billion dollars worth of rupees to russia and russia is only buying i think 2 to 4 2 to 4 i don't remember the exact number billion dollars worth of uh, it exports from india so the russians are grumbling what are we going to do with this 36 billion dollars worth of rupees we don't have any use for it so india needs to focus on such engagements where there is a rupee trade and how can they increase exports is there a plan that the modi government has to improve the increase the exports to russia sir no i think that there is a two is a i mean it's a great question and um, Uh, it's a great point that is being discussed and debated as far as russia is concerned cg it rather would have excess credit or excess surplus in a currency uh, with its oil being consumed and paid for rather than it remaining in its containers or remaining in its wells because that is no money so i think it is focused on dispensing and building up this credit how it would exactly use we don't know um in terms of uh, modi's plan modi is saying no problem you know i'll give it to you in rupees you supply me through your ships that way you are not violating the international norms uh you know i know you charge me uh eight, close to 80 dollars in couple of months i diverted some of this to uh, my uh middle eastern friends but you want to uh, you don't want to uh, give me more i'll go somewhere else and buy it but you want me to uh buy from you and follow the international convention you going to pay me only by rupee ruble trade you have a credit we'll figure this out as the time goes on maybe you know sanctions will be lifted and you may want to take it back in us dollar that that that's the that's the way modi is modi government is playing out if you want to play play if you don't want to play 
good luck so that that maneuverability that negotiating power has come to india because of its overall economic growth so those of you who are thinking so what if it is 7% so what if it is 6.5% it makes a huge difference because what will happen is overall if your crude costs are contained then all the indirect costs such as green costs rice costs wheat costs of transportation costs all these things they have a 4x factor i've done this thing many times i've told you many times the impact is four times uh, and uh, this has been studied in third world countries in sri lanka and turkey over a period of 20 years and that's what happens so if you keep the crude prices under control inflation in countries like india will be under control especially when it is developing fast money is a you know there is there is more money circulation in india and again modi has tackled that by trying to reduce money circulation and increase upi based payment so a lot of things are happening guys it's not a single isolated instance you can narrow down and say because of this something is happening no it's a combination of all these things wheels within wheels everything moving in unison i think india is riding this wave out much better than even accomplished i would say accomplished in double quotes countries like united states where you are seeing so many issues sidhu ji let's go on to israel the three us troops killed and up to 34 injured in jordan drone strike along syrian border linked to iran sir there is a theory that a returning us drone was shadowed by an iranian drone which is what ended up in the casualties because us was thinking oh one of the drones we sent is coming back so they did not fire at it how true is this sir Well, I think that there are um, in all these stories, in all these uh, incidents, um, there is a, a color, or there is um, uh, a two-sided or a multi-sided view facet that is given. The truth is still coming out. This particular location is called Tower Twenty Two. Much of the activities in Tower Twenty Two is unknown. It is at an important vertex point. Uh, if we can show the map. Uh, then i'll just uh, f- finish my answer uh, ne- this is the area this is called as the tower 22 and the us troops that were killed in jordan were linked to this iranian um, shadow drone or uh, a mistaken uh, inside attack whatever you may want to call but this is a very secluded area and the fact that this area has been attacked and uh, people have lost lives has stirred up a huge issue within united states and the fact that the us is not responding uh, to this except in statements is also causing much anxiety if you go to the next slide um yes now if you see um this particular map these are all the different locations where you have us footprint or us bases the attack that t- took place uh, in the jordan Iraq Syria border is close to the Al Tanf garrison the, the garrison uh, you can see the important strategic point where that is located and the fact that uh, the fact that many of these bases were have been attacked by the Iranian proxies or the three hs or one of the three hs or two of the three hs is a reflection and a worry as to how the iranians got access to this level of information as it relates to the us bases located within what are the consequences if these bases kind of get out forget the story about forget the importance of the story about the tower 22 and the drone what exactly is the truth we'll get to know in um, uh, you know which version of it prevails whether it was mistaken or whether it was actually taken out Uh, how this um, tower 22 was detected all this is going to come out but what is very astonishing about this is if you now look at this map which we have shared with you is that there is a complete plot and most of these places as we have pointed out the irgc has a footprint okay we only talked about syria we talked about gaza we talked about iraq we talked about Oh, how it is it has now even come into jordan so there is a significant amount of intelligence that is now available and what is causing concern in united states is why 
United States is not acting. And what we are getting out of United States is we don't want to start a war with the proxy Iranian groups, nor we want to expand the war, nor we want to fight a war with Iran. What does this send as a message to all these proxies and the Iranians? Yes, indeed. And um, so this is the overall picture. Sir, do you want to talk to this, sir? Yes, the overall picture. Why we are sharing this is if you take a look at the Iran as it cuts into Iraq, then makes its way into Jordan, into the Palestine, uh, you know, the Gaza. In the middle is Israel, then Lebanon and Syria. The plot of the Iran is to redraw this map along. And the only piece that they are not going to touch is the Saudis. Otherwise, it's a very broad, greater Shia territory. And they have plotted various locations. The U.S. forces are stake, stationed post-Iraq war. Remember, Iraq and Iran fought multi-year war, which resulted in economic casualties. The great thing that the United States did was replacing the regime which provided the stability and the buffer. Now it is carte blanche. Iran has access across the entire spectrum. And it's not United States which is fighting. It's Israel which is fighting this war. Be it in Syria, be it in Lebanon, be it in the Jordan border, be it in Iraq, and taking the war all the way to Iran. The only place where they are still not fighting is the Houthis in Yemen because the Houthis are not targeting the Israel, but they are creating economic disruptions in Red Sea as well as in the Gulf of Aden, um, as well as in the uh, Straits of Hormuz. So you can begin to um, understand the picture when you look at this, the, the, the Tower 22 area, when you look at the broad footprint of the Americans in the Iraq and the strategic importance of that especially as it relates to the Kurds as well as the Turkish border. And then, of course, um, you have the attacks taking place extending now into Jordan. So it's a very broad um, uh, spectrum of activity, uh, both economic disruption and geographic expansion, which Iran is trying to do. And they have really planned this out very well, Sriji, in terms of imprinting through proxies the IRGC. Thank you, sir. Let's go on to Israel. Uh, Biden administration, while promising a response, I think we covered this. Israel is launching air attacks south of Damascus in Syria against the IRGC operational command centers, killing five to seven people. Now, the UNRWA, huge controversy. They have now found out every Palestinian working for UNRWA was actually complicit in the October 7 attack. This is, I, I think this is the international court, ICJ findings. So they have fired all of them. Now people are saying that you need to sack all these heads. This could not have happened without them knowing about it. Since when did UN become so one-sided, Sridharji? Always was, Sriji. Always. Always was. Uh, UN was uh, the great left wing and uh, it always was. It is highly compromised. It is uh, complicit now with the Chinese. It is complicit with the left wing groups. It's complicit with, uh, with uh, anti-Israeli forces. Have you ever seen... Israel being, Israel's uh, sufferings being, uh, you know, condemned, uh, uh, you know, by the United Nations? No, only United States and some Western allies stand up and make a comment. You have a broad spectrum of people dominated by the left, which is mostly in Africa, Middle East nations, they always kind of uh, put the blame on a very small nation, which is getting pummeled, uh, uh, you know, on all sides uh, by these uh, by, by, by I don't know what is the right name, but by the by the anti-Israel bloc and anti-Israel forces. I mean, UNRWA is uh, is astonishing in terms of uh, what they have done. And many West again, you see many Western nations, which is you know now the latest to join this list is Japan. So you have United States, you have Canada, you have Italy, you have Australia, you have New Zealand, you have Germany, you have France. Now Japan has joined this. And it's a very kind of uh, compelling story. Will anything change in UN? Nothing. Nothing will change in UN. 
everybody knows the um, various what happened in who what happened in uh, you know the adjacent un bodies what happened in the covid investigations nothing shriji so there should be no surprise that the un is a defunct organization it is outdated you know it's uh, as india has been pushing the case that the un needs reform but it will not happen Sridhar ji, this last item, Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps says that it has seized an oil tanker carrying 2 million liters of fuel off the coast of southwestern Iran. I'm also hearing that India helped Iran in this case. Is it true? I don't know about that, ji, that whether India helped in uh, uh, in the actual seizure or helped Iran in, uh, in, in, uh, uh, in the acquisition uh, or the uh, uh, seizure of this vessel. But the reason why we are pointing out is how is the war getting funded? Remember, we asked this question, how is the war getting yeah. funded? These ships that are being seized and stolen and the oil is being sold, you know, I don't know, 10 cents in a dollar, 20 cents in a dollar or, you know, at 80 percent discount. OK, it's cash. OK, move from container to container. We, na- we discussed and walked you through how this uh, ghost armada operates and how the how the uh, you know they are officially kind of uh, under various countries which lend their flags this oil gets navigated and you know who are one or two big buyers of this oil uh, and you know this is the this is the way they are funding the war it's cash sales and the money gets distributed you you seize a container uh, you take the you take the oil you sell the oil even before it gets docked somewhere and that money goes into, and we drew the map as to where all the money is going. Uh, this is how the the, uh, the, uh, the 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 this war is getting funded in a surreptitious manner by Iran and its proxies. <laughs> U.S. major stories: Nancy Pelosi suddenly is up now, asking for an FBI investigation into the organized protest across U.S. and alleges Russian link. So she can say whatever she wants. She's an octogenarian, a doddering one at that. Half the time, she's not lucid, just like uh, President Biden. I can't. Why are these doddering octogenarians close to nanogenarians still sitting around in U.S. directing policy, sir? And I'm calling across the aisles here. Yeah. It's election time, Sriji. Former president. And a lot of people had commented, you know, what we use. You know, we kind of seamlessly use these words. Former President Trump, who is contesting for presidency, is leading the polls. They do not want another presidency of Trump. So therefore, which is the best connection that you can think of? Russia. Okay, remember, go back to 2016. The great word of the Democrats is Russia. Russian interference, Russian interference, Russian funding of the protests, Russian Russian propaganda. Lo and behold, it's not Russia, it's China which did a lot of damage. Now, forget China. We know who is funding this protest. The guy who is funding the protest has acknowledged that he has paid for this money. And yet, Madam Pelosi stands up and says, it's Russians. So therefore, FBI. Who is FBI? One party's ally. So you launch FBI, you launch CIA, you come up with some wonderful kind of conclusions. We have established it is Russia's links. Sriji, that's the truth. Sir, interestingly, this is the video that's making the rounds in social media. Somebody accosted Nancy Pelosi at her home in San Francisco, asking her some difficult questions. And her response to this lady, I, I, I was only seeing the back of that person. Uh, maybe she is Asian. He said, go back to China. <laughs> I mean, this is laughable, Sridharji. Is she lucid or is she saying some nonsense? You know, San Francisco city has close to 25 to 30 percent Chinese Americans. We brought them along in 200 years ago when we are railing, putting down the U.S. railroad. We needed the Chinese to be quick and nimble so that they could put the dynamite and run away before the blast took place. Otherwise, you would have never finished the railway line between East Coast and West Coast. I don't know, Ashriji. I think uh, Nancy Pelosi and her husband, they're very interesting people. Uh, you know, congratulations to her. She ran the largest, she ran longest, uh, the House Speakership, you know, good to her. And, but this is an astonishing statement coming from uh, Madam Pelosi Shriji. 
Uh, and then you have the two presidents. Then you have the three presidents, uh, you know, all saying rah, rah, rah. And my bet is still that by August, President, uh, current President Biden will not be in the electoral ballots. There will be a new candidate. That's my prediction, Sriji. <laughs> and that is most likely going to be Michelle Obama. Most likely, yes. They're calling it for Michelle Obama. <laughs> yes. The Democrats want Michelle Obama, the most powerful candidate. David Axelrod says, Mr. Biden, you are incognito. A lot of Democrats are saying, with your candidacy, it's impossible uh, for you to win the re-election. So please step down so we can find the right candidate who resonates with most of the Democrats. And then you have President, uh, former President Obama saying, hey, you know, Mr. Biden, you know, there's a lot of problems here. Uh, we are worried, extremely worried that the Trump uh, poll numbers are rising. So now what happens? You have Biden, Obama, uh, uh, and uh, President Clinton, uh, former President Clinton, uh, let me apologize, former President Clinton, all standing up on single dice and saying, rah, 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 you know, we have done a great job here. We have created world chaos and anarchy, and we have got protests galore. We got 8 million illegals. You know, our budget has gone out of whack. We are $34 trillion in. Guess what? Everything is hunky-dory. Re-elect President Biden or whosoever is the Democratic nominee. This is going to be the story, Sriji. Um, Sriji, Mayorkas, why is this becoming more and more significant? Sir, the, he's the Department of Homeland Security, right? He's the Secretary of DHS, isn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. So, now, um, yeah, yeah, go ahead, yeah, sir. sir. So, no, 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 no. I'll, I'll, you ask, you frame it, and then we'll discuss, Sriji. So, my question, sir, is GOP has a razor thin majority in the House. They don't have a majority in Senate. Clearly, they know that even if they pass the impeachment resolution in the House, it's not going to pass in Senate. Be that as it may, why are we wasting taxpayer dollars doing this thing? The same question I've asked Nancy Pelosi also. You did what, two times impeached Donald Trump? What did it lead to? Nothing. All politicians belong to the same tribe, same herd. Shiji, it doesn't matter whether the court, whether the court is a Republican or whether they're Democrats. So why are Republicans engaged? Uh, they have been as frustrated as the Democrats. Democrats couldn't impeach President Trump. Couldn't uh, you know? Couldn't find anything substantive in the two years when they held sway in the House and in the Senate. Now it is the turn of the House Republicans. They promised that they will act. So they are conducting these investigations. They fail uh, to, to kind of uh, pin down uh, uh, Hunter Biden and uh, President Biden. Um, now they are on to Mayorkas. Uh, Mayorkas remains a low-hanging fruit uh, because of the porous borders and the amount of illegals who have flown into the country. So they've drafted their articles and they're basically going to, you know, by a thin, way for thin majority, they're going to say, okay, we impeach. Uh, he has been found guilty. So it's a political point scoring victory, but that actually translates into any outcome uh, from a from an election impact point of view. We don't know, but two, two critical things that are in the minds of the people. One is the economic mismanagement. That is number one. Number two is the chaos that is prevalent in United States. These two issues are in the mind, not Mallorca's, uh, at least of all, Sriji. Thank you, sir. And in you know, European news, Hungarian foreign minister, the genocide claim against Israel at ICJ is fake and we back Israel. Is this a new case that is in ICJ or the one that just finished, sir? I just finished. Uh, he's just basically saying that, you know, Israel get back to business. There's no need for you to report back to this ICJ once a month. Uh, there's no case. It's all, a, you know, there's, a, there. in fact, the, the uh, uh, ICJ itself has stated, you know, hey, create a corridor, uh, avoid genocide. Uh, you know, if there's any Israelis, uh, hold them accountable. Israel says, no problem. We'll do all of this, the, all of those things. So there's no case. So uh, as far as uh, the, 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 this is the, the right wing within the euro is raising its arms against the left. And Hungary is front and center of this, followed by some of the uh, Eastern European nations and some of the Baltic states, uh, and uh, some of the Scandinavian states. So. 
Sridharji, we talked about this, that there was a plane that was carrying 65 to 75 prisoners of war uh, that crashed near the border of Russia and Ukraine. What is the latest on this, sir? No, no information on that after that. Belgoid region. We actually put up a map and said, and well, wait for the yeah. information. Ukrainians are saying there was no plane. There's no evidence of a plane. So what are they talking about? And did they kill these prisoners who were meant to be part of the negotiations, the, the Ukrainian prisoners of war? Um, it just has become a smoke screen. Given the calamity around the world, it has kind of dissipated. They even showed up some bodies which the Ukrainian relatives say that's not their uh, relatives based on whatever they, little these Ukrainian relatives have seen. So this looks like another hoax that was thrown up. Why it was looks like. Okay, we don't want because there's nothing concrete to tell us one way or the other way. But thus far, there is no evidence of this plane or the prisoners who lost their lives as a result of this crash, Sriji. So Russia is now beginning to join its big brother, China, in the South China Sea. Indeed, Sriji, you are an expert on Chinese submarines and why they don't work. So it's obviously <laughs> the Russian. <laughs> you are, you are Sriji. So therefore, uh, you can see that I think this was an exercise uh, which probably was conducted on behalf of the Chinese. Um, the mock exercise resulted in, uh, you know, from um, Marshal uh, Shaposhnikov, uh, a helicopter or a drone flying. A mock submarine object was detected. It was shot and taken out. All of this was simulated as an exercise that, uh, you know, the submarines under the South China Sea can be detected by the Russian kind of the fleet in support or with supporting the Chinese should there be a war. Otherwise, there's no reason for this vessel to come in. And, and they point out they do this exercise once in 18 months. This was the turn. Is nothing but another kind of a bunkum that is going on in uh, the rattling that is going on because there is a weak and incompetent president in United States. There's a weak prime minister in UK. There's only one person who is capable of doing anything. That is the French president Macron uh, and Mr. Scholes in uh, the German chancellor would have nothing of it. He is kind of hunky-dory lost somewhere within German history. And in Asian news headlines, North Korea test submarines launched uh, cruise missiles in its latest salvo. Um, Sridharji, now we talked in our last episode that North Korea could be the new adversary for the United States. And, and they have been launching missiles at South Korea. Um, sir, this is, a, uh, you know, it's a strange thing that I've seen. The South Koreans want to unite with North Korea. North Korea don't, doesn't seem to have the same kind of feelings. North Korea is North Korean dictator or dictators, which is part of the same family, has sustained and survived based on fear of threat and fear of persecution and a single party, uh, single family, which has effectively controlled and contrived and effectively plundered. They have been forced, supported and uh, enabled by two nations, Russia and China. Both have given them plenty of capacity and plenty of capabilities and provided the conduit. Somehow the North Korean dictatorship wants a place. I think President or former President Trump played to his ego and kept him in his place. You said, as long as you keep your toys within your island, it's okay. Don't try to, uh, we recognize you. If you want, you know, I'll have a meeting with you. Uh, but if you want to bring your toy out, then we will also bring our toys out. That message that, uh, you know, the North Koreans heard. What, what do we have, uh, Shriji? Again, you know, I mean, I'm at pains to point out. I've never seen in my long, as is the case with you, many years of living. This is probably one of the, the weakest regime that we have ever seen. And many things are in disarray in the world as a result of it. And North Korea is right at the top of its region. I find it very interesting. The next news item, Japan is going to allow 5G access for drones paving way for high-res videos. Sir, 5G technology implementation, you have to have multiple hops. 
in order to be able to sustain the higher bandwidth. If you're having a drone, how are they going to accomplish this? I'm curious. No, I think I'll give a strategic answer rather than a technical answer in terms of uh, the usage of 5G that you are alluding to. The Japanese have recognized that they have to defend the small island. Okay, they have found out that they can defend themselves, but the greatest threat that they face is the drones that are likely to come out. The way the war is, the war was is being fought in Russia, Ukraine. The way the proxy wars are being fought in Iran, and there's nothing that prevents North Koreans from acquiring this capability, which are capable of uh, being weaponized. So they feel not that they had give, they had restricted the access, uh, especially for the defense purposes. So they're saying they're going to allow. Does it mean that it's going to operate from tomorrow? Does it mean that all the hubs are in place? Don't know, Sriji. But I think Japan is recognizing the only way it can defend itself, as you can. I mean, we have repeatedly pointed out pointed out Senkaku, which is owned, which is both uh, Japanese and Chinese contesting for it. And then the northern side, you have uh, the Russians fighting them. And then you have North Korea saying they're going to target and launch missiles in Japan, against Japan. So they're saying that they need to prepare themselves. And that is the significance of this particular news item, which is being discussed by a number of people. Um, how exactly they will deploy the technology, I don't know, Sriji, but we will share as it, as it gets, uh, as we have more information. Thank you, sir. And U.S. and Philippines are going to be holding a 2 plus 2 talk for the first time in Manila. Again, the South China is heating up. I still, Sridharji, can't believe that China would embark on so many different fronts when its domestic front is doing so poorly. I'm hearing that there isn't enough food going around. And uh, we've been talking about this. China is a special segment. Plus, their submarines are noisy. They are error prone. And uh, now we can see the proof. Russia has come in. Russia makes functioning stuff. May not be less noisy, but it, it functions better, I guess. So wrap it up for us. This South China fetish, they, they want Taiwan. They want Arunachal Pradesh. Something is going to give. What do you think, in your opinion, is going to give? I think what is going to give is that somebody is going to find an appropriate way to deal with Mr. Xi Jinping and there would be a new leader who says this is not helping China, our economy is tanking. We haven't even discussed Evergrande, you know, in terms of its, uh, um, what you call, uh, dissolution and what is going to happen. We'll, we'll do that in another session. But all this chaos that China is trying to create uh, is basic, you know, that is the only plank that Xi Jinping is used in terms of, you know, lifelong or the, the, the successful presidency campaign that he launched. He ousted so many people. He consolidated power. He even ousted his foreign minister and the defense uh, minister to make sure that he has his people to say rah, rah, rah. His whole plea is great China, greater China, reunification of Taiwan, and unilateral access for trade across Indian Ocean and South China Sea. That is the plank in which he is kind of fooling his people. He has to deliver something. And I think that when he tries to do so, he is going to end up a loser. But somehow, Sri Ji, we'll cover this in the next episode. The way Biden is backtracking on China, China is succeeding without firing a bullet. And that's, again, there's something that is going on behind the scenes that China is pushing. And it is still, still trying to rattle. And most of the businesses think that somehow reunification of Taiwan will happen without a bullet being fired. And Xi Jinping, Xi Jinping will win. That's what is going to happen. Certainly, that's not going to happen in Arunachal Pradesh or any other part of India. But it could very well happen in the case of Taiwan Shiji. Viewers, if you want to know what hook or hold China has over the Bidens, read the book Red Handed. And in that book, it is explained how there was an entity called the CEFC, China Energy Financing Consortium or something like that. The book claims $32 million were siphoned off from that entity into 
various accounts of the Biden family, Biden's brother, uh, Hunter Biden, and, and a few other people. And, and they, they have not been sued. Interestingly, if, they, if that was false, the Biden should have sued them, sued the writer. He's a very famous, reputed writer. I don't remember the name of his. I've read the book. In fact, we have done 10 sessions, Sridharji, uh, on detailing the role of uh, how much China has uh, infiltrated the various organizations, the universities, Hollywood, politics in the United States, and so on and so forth. And this is apolitical. We have taken pot shots. I mean, this is a, we are just analyzing the book. The book says that Mitch McConnell's wife amazingly finds, you know, some secretarial position. Doesn't matter if it's a Republican administration in place or a Democratic uh, um, administration in place. You know, some things I cannot explain in the United States government, how people land in their, you know, get a job regardless of which party is in power. So these are all questions that need to be asked. We are asking these questions. One small request, we had close to 540 or 550 people watching this video at a given time. That would mean that probably about 4,000 have already watched this video. And I only got 200 likes. This is where we really need your help, guys. As soon as you start watching, you can see the amount of research that's gone into it. We spend two days sometimes just to try to get enough in there so that it's not too long. At the same time, it's got good substance. So all we ask of you is, just like this video and the rest will take care of itself. Thank you once again, Vijay um, Sridharji, and I'll be seeing you again on Saturday. Namaskar. Namaskar. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful day.